Greetings, fellow explorers. This is Tony with Fount Systems Network, and we are here in pursuit of low-carbon innovations for industrial wastewater treatment. This is episode one of two on treating wastewater for metal finishing operations. It's taken me a little bit longer than usual to put this episode together. For one thing, I've signed up for a Class C wastewater operator's licensure course. This is taking some of my focus. And secondly, I've learned that metal finishing is a pretty broad category. So it's taken me a little bit more time than usual to figure out what it's about in order that I can communicate what's interesting and important about it with you. Metal finishing operations involve some of the more toxic contaminants in the world. Arsenic, cyanide, chromium, and lead are just a few of the commonly managed toxins. If any of these get out into the environment in any significant quantities, they are detrimental to human and environmental health, and they can significantly interfere with the biological treatment processes of sewage treatment plants as well. So we Americans require manufacturers to manage their toxins at the source. In this episode, I'm going to provide a quick refresher on the Clean Water Act. Then we're going to look at a chrome plating shop in action. Then we're going to shift and we're going to look at an existing permit for a big electroplating shop in Miami, one which also happens to be a super fun site. And finally, we'll look at how effective treatment and management have been for the metal finishing industry of the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin as a whole over a 25 year period. If you're new to Fount Systems Network, here's an introduction to what we've been working on and what we've been working toward. And as always, if you like what you see here on the channel, please like and subscribe. Let's get started. To start, the Clean Water Act was passed into law in 1972 because Americans decided to finally do something to halt the fish kills that were happening on a recurring basis in our inland water bodies. These fish kills were largely the result of discharges from the thousands of relatively primitive sewage treatment plants that were in operation at the time. But this EPA report also points to industrial and agricultural discharges being a cause of fish kills as well. I also suspect that the Cuyahoga River Fire of 1969 made it glaringly obvious that something needed to be done about industrial wastewater. The river caught on fire. The Clean Water Act makes it mandatory for both sewage treatment plants and industrial manufacturers to clean up their wastewater effluent to some regulated standard before they discharge it into our lakes and rivers. Additionally, the Clean Water Act regulates industrial users who discharge their wastewater into our sewage systems. Our local sewage utilities are just not equipped to handle the huge variety and toxicity of effluents that industrial users generate. And there really is a prodigious pageant of industrial users. So that was a little primer on the environmental history and the regulatory environment in the U.S. Now, let's look at one kind of metal finishing operation at work. This one is a small chrome plating shop in India. So here we can see the chemicals they use. The first step in surface preparation is called anodic cleaning. The second step in surface prep is called sulfuric acid etching. Now we have the first metal primer coating called strike nickel. Then we have another primer coat called strike copper. Then we have the first finish coat called bright acid copper. Then we have the second finish coat called bright nickel. Finally, we have the finished top coat of bright chrome. And here we can see the final product here with a chrome finish. It's super important to note that between each of these steps, there is a rinsing operation, which generates some of the wastewater that we're interested in, but it's the spent chemical baths that especially need to get treated. I chose that last video because it provides a visually clear and intimate example of the treatment steps involved in one metal finishing operation, which is an electroplating shop. But that shop is really very small and hands-on. Here's an example of an industrial scale operation. I'm sure you can imagine the huge quantities of toxins in the wastewater generated at some of the larger metal finishing operations around the world. So let's circle back to the United States and look at how metal finishing shops are regulated through the Clean Water Act. As you might recall from a prior episode, earlier this year, I contacted various industrial pretreatment program managers around the state of Florida. This work enabled me to obtain information on existing permits and users throughout the state. We are looking here at a portion of a spreadsheet that I put together. This spreadsheet includes businesses participating in the various industrial pretreatment programs around Florida, in this case in Miami. 
I'm just going to zoom in here on one of the regulatory categories of interest to us today. This is EPA category 413, which is for electroplating, which we just saw in the last sequence. The permit we're looking at is for a larger electroplating shop in Miami, which also happens to be a Superfund site. Now, if we look at this company's active permit, we can see that they're required to report test results for their treated wastewater on a monthly basis. They're testing for cadmium, chromium, copper, cyanide, lead, nickel, silver, and zinc. You can see there are additional toxins that they have to report semi-annually, and the permit also indicates a flow rate of up to 80,000 gallons per day. You know I can't resist doing a quick data exploration of this information. If we take the 80,000 gallons per day, which is their maximum wastewater flow, we can then in turn do a calculation on the total quantity of contaminants that this particular business could be allowed to discharge in the sewer system. Then let's look at their monthly actual testing reports to see how much they're actually discharging and then compare them. The way I interpret this data is that the amount of heavy metals and other toxins that they are allowed to discharge into the sewer system appears to be pretty low, while the amount that they're actually discharging is much lower than that. So let's take a look at cyanide, for example. The permit allows them to discharge up to a third pound of cyanide per day into the sewer system, but they're actually discharging about 1 40th of that, just 3.8 grams. Likewise with zinc, they could be discharging more than a thousand times the amount that they're actually discharging. So in short, the Clean Water Act has compelled the company to perform to some minimum standard, and the wastewater treatment system that they're using appears to be enabling them to exceed those standards by a significant amount. Now let's take a look at another case study in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And this time we're going to look at the metal loadings in the wastewater influent for the entire city. And then we're going to look at what the city's treatment system in turn is discharging into Lake Michigan. It's called the Metal Loading Study, and it's produced by the National Association of Surface Finishing, and it covers a 25-year time period between about 1990 and 2015. I'll add here that I communicated with the Industrial Pretreatment Program Manager in Milwaukee, and he confirmed with me that the data here are accurate. Let's look at chromium. This study suggests that the sum total of chromium discharges into the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District, that's the MMSD here, into the sewage system from metal finishers totaled a little over a pound per day. Notably here, the district is receiving 57 pounds per day of chromium from sources other than the metal finishing industry. Fellow explorers, guess where this other 57 pounds of chromium is coming from? Leather tanneries. The IPP manager tells me that Milwaukee has four leather tanneries also discharging into the sewer system, and that's where the chromium's coming from. We explored wastewater from leather tanneries in an earlier episode. Cyanide influent here appears to be very low, less than 0.2 pounds per day. There appear to be no other sources of cyanide in Milwaukee. For lead, we see the metal finishing industry discharges 0.07 pounds of lead per day into the sewer, while other unidentified sources discharge over 30 pounds of lead into the sewer system. The same study also compares these present day discharges with those from the early 90s and shows significant reductions across all categories on a per user basis, particularly when it regards cadmium and lead. So here's where things get really interesting. Ultimately, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District discharges their treated effluent into Lake Michigan. So the metal loading study also looks at metal pollution that makes its way all the way through the sewage treatment system untreated. Even as late as 2016, the report suggests that the Milwaukee Sewer District is discharging more than nine pounds of chromium into Lake Michigan per day. But now, let's compare this with the early 90s, and we can see that they used to discharge more than 10 times this amount. In 1990, in the left column, we see that the influent received by the district held more than 1,300 pounds of chromium per day. And it looks like they did a heroic job getting most of it out, because they in turn discharged about 80 pounds per day into Lake Michigan. But let's look at 2015, 25 years later. The district is receiving about 60 pounds of chromium per day. They're removing more than 80% of that, and they're discharging a little less than 10 pounds of chromium per day into Lake Michigan. I also suspect that this is the more benign trivalent chromium that's left over after treating for the carcinogenic hexavalent chromium in the plant. But honestly, I didn't ask the IPP manager about it. And let's look at lead here. Significant improvements have been made since the 90s. I expect the improvements to influent quality 
have probably been the result of controlling discharges at the source, substantially because of the industrial pretreatment program. The IPP manager tells me that their lead concentrations have been so low for so long that they don't even have discharge limits. I'm interpreting this to mean that the lead discharges they do have are meeting some quality criteria determined by environmental scientists. So what are metal finishers doing to get these results? How do they treat their wastewater, and what improvements have they made over the last 25 years? These questions, my fellow explorers, we are going to investigate in our next episode, which is on treatment methods for wastewater from metal finishing. I'd like to know what you think. Has the Clean Water Act been successful at cleaning up America's waterways? Do you think that if industry had been left to police itself, that the outcomes would have been better or worse? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Well, that's it for now, everyone. Thank you for watching. If you like what you see here on the Found Systems Network, please like and subscribe to the channel. Follow us on Twitter. And remember, everyone, keep exploring, keep growing. I'll see you next time.